uh, before we get started today. My name is Ryan. For those of you that are new, so glad you've joined us. Uh, we are on what's historically called Palm Sunday. It is the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, and that's just in God's providence and plan is uh, that we're going to be looking at that text this morning in the Gospel of John. So it really wasn't, as I've said before, a super strategic plan for me to be here on this uh, text uh, this morning, but it just so happened, and I'm so glad it did. So it's going to be really cool. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19 is where we're going to be this morning. If you've got a device, you can open it up, or for those of you online, check that out, and we'll have some of the scriptures on screen as well. Hey, this morning, I just want to say, man, uh, North Valley Kids is growing. Last week, they had a record attendance of uh, kids in their program. And so um, just special thanks to the teachers and everybody's investing into the next generation. Let's celebrate that just for a moment. <clears throat> so important in today's time to invest in the lives of young people. And uh, at this church, that's definitely what we're doing, partnering with parents to to make a difference. Uh, the kids at North Valley Kids will go through the entire Bible um, with a strong Jesus focus two different times. Maybe it's three, and I could be misquoting here, but before they get out of the fifth grade. So they get a major Bible uh, worldview. In fact, one of the testimonies that we're going to have during the Easter service is a young man in our church, a new believer, um, was baptized in our church, grew in his faith tremendously, and he said, what should I do, Pastor Ryan? I said, go teach at North Valley Kids, because you're going to teach the Bible two to three times if you just stick with it for several years, and you're going to learn a ton. So, um, and so I'm excited about what God's doing over at North Valley Kids. A couple of other things real quick. Baptisms are coming up. Uh, if you have not been baptized before, um, and you are a profess, professing Jesus Christ as Lord, um, we teach what the Bible teaches, that it's baptizing, bapti baptism by immersion. And so we do it like Jesus did it, the apostles did it, the church uh, history leaders have done it. And so we're doing that on three of the services on Easter uh, morning. So um, how many of you uh, love baptisms? Raise your hand. How many of you, uh, it's a celebration. It should be a celebration of uh, new people living their life in Jesus Christ. It's real exciting to see that. So um, Good Friday services are kicking off. So you should have a little uh, handout right beside you. If you'll take those, make best usage of those, and, and maybe place it in the hands of a friend or a family member. As well, you should receive an invite email in your inbox today. So if you've uh, put in your information, and then you could just send it out via email, or you can physically hand somebody an invite. But our Good Friday services are kicking off. Uh, we have one. This will be the first time we've done this. Uh, Friday, I think it's 6.30 p.m. Uh, Good Friday is, and we have featuring gospel country music. That's a first. We'll see if that's a an, uh, fantastic or a flop. We'll see how that goes. Um, there's a young family that's uh, leading that. It's a father, son, and daughter, and so excited for that. That'll be uh, outdoor service, 6.30 p.m. this Friday. Don't miss it. And then, again, the Easter services. We're having uh, four different Easter services. We'll have a sunrise uh, service at 6.30. It'll be a little shorter message, a little, lot shorter worship set, but we'll do it right out side here in the courtyard, and then we're doing three indoor services. So plenty of uh, room and space to invite your friends and family. Uh, you don't want to miss it. So um, Jason, the young man that led worship, will be leading worship for us on Easter. They did a good job this morning, didn't they? Okay, so uh, excited about what's happening today. Um, uh, let me pray for us, and we're going to get into God's Word. Lord Jesus, thank you so much uh, for the privilege of teaching the Bible, um, Lord, and more important than the Bible is you. Uh, you're the God of the Bible, and we thank you for that. We need you, Jesus, more than anything in our lives uh, to change us, to rearrange us, and help us in our uh, everyday life. We thank you for the hope we find in Christ. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Uh, the message series that I'm teaching in this season is called The Road to Easter. It is a uh, treacherous road. Uh, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, not by force, but by choice. It's a very dangerous road to follow. How many of you have ever been on a very dangerous road before? Uh, raise your hand. Think of the most dangerous road you've ever been on. Uh, 
Recently, a few weeks ago, I got, uh, we got on a plane. We flew over to Maui, Hawaii, one of the most beautiful places in the world. 20-year uh, celebration of our uh, marriage. My wife and I land. It's nighttime. The Avis gives us the rental car. We're glad. It was a uh, convertible Mustang. We were so excited. We get in, and there's like a, I don't, we would call it a monsoon, but it's a major tropical storm. And so we drive out of the airport at night j fatigued, and the windshield wipers aren't working. And so uh, little did I know, the next morning after the fog had cleared, the road that we were driving on, there was a cliff on the other side. And uh, it was incredibly dangerous uh, for us to navigate. Additionally, there's more dangerous roads in Maui. One of the, if you Google right now, most dangerous roads in the world, probably what would pop up is the road to... Hana. Yeah. So we did that thing. We did the road to Hana. And it was really cool. One of the drivers, he was driving, he was probably, the only, he was young, 20-something-year-old guy, very smart, very well-educated. He was a Hawaiian, which was awesome to have, a Hawaiian tour guide. And he made the disclaimer right off the front. He said, hey, just so you know, we're going to go through some very treacherous trails and roads. There'll be cliffs on the side. And none of you ladies, I want to hear, ooh, ah, oh, I'm like, man, this guy's coming off strong right off the bat. And my wife's like sitting beside me. She's like, gosh, like I can't indicate I'm scared. He said, furthermore, I will cross the yellow line all throughout the trip. And I don't want to hear any bad reviews. I don't want you to write a bad review. <laughs> I'm like, boy, this guy is controlling the narrative. Uh, then he furthermore, he said, uh, and furthermore, I'm going to honk at anybody who's in my way. And I'm like, this is very interesting. So we felt like King Hawaii flying through the road to Hana. Anybody that was in the way would get, uh, 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 and scared tourists would pull over, and we'd just fly by. Um, a dangerous road. That's the road Jesus is on. Uh, the coming of King Jesus, verses 12 through 18, it says this, that the next day, the large crowd that had come had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a powerful city, massive city for its day and time, uh, the capital city, um, and it's the next day. I, it's debated on what day this actually is, but church history celebrates Palm Sunday on, Palm, on Sunday. Some historians and scholars would say, no, this is maybe Monday or whatever. Um, I think it's Sunday, uh, and it's just days ahead. It's Sunday, and then on Friday, we know Jesus will go to the, help me out, the cross. In studying this, I thought about the coming of King Jesus. He's going to the very place where he's already the most wanted. He's, he's going to the place where they're going to crucify him. And there's rumors about, I told you, it's like Jesus is Jerusalem's most wanted. And Lazarus is too now, because he rose from the dead, and he's bearing witness about Jesus, and the crowds are getting crazy. But it's a large crowd. Uh, some scholars have estimated um, Josephus, a Jewish historian, said at the peak of the Passover season, it would be like a week of celebration, of remembering God's deliverance for uh, the, the, the Jewish people when God freed them from slavery, from the bondage and oppression, uh, and used Moses to deliver them. Um, they would, on the Passover, they would take a lamb, they would slaughter it, as a reminder of that great event, one scholar says that up to 250,000 lambs were slaughtered during Passover. That's a quarter of a million. That'd be pretty bloody. Um, some have reported the, the streets and areas where there was just blood all throughout the streets. And while it was a, a festive time, it was, it was a very uh, interesting time where People from all over, though, at the peak of this Passover, you could estimate, well, was the lamb, was it for one individual or was it for many? Uh, most of the time, if you had enough money to buy a lamb for Passover, as a Jewish believer, it would be for the whole family. So if, the, if you took the 250,000 lambs that were slaughtered on the Passover, if each lamb was used to sacrifice for a family, 
um, of 10 or so, that would be some 2.5 million people that were gathering in Jerusalem. Um, they're loud. The crowds are growing and uh, unprecedented amounts of people are populating Jerusalem. The surrounding towns and cities can not only see the lights and see the caravans and the pouring of people and pilgrims coming into Jerusalem, but they can hear them. How many of you have been to a, a big football game or maybe a, a baseball game before? And before you uh, even step foot out of the parking lot, you open the door and you can hear the crowds of people inside that stadium. Uh, multiply that uh, in tremendous amounts. And so here's what they're saying. Uh, verse 13, Jesus is coming to town. And it says, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They're shouting out the word Hosanna means to save us. What they wanted was a king. And this has been mentioned multiple times in John's gospel already and the other gospel accounts is that they wanted to try to make Jesus a king because he had miraculous powers and they figured maybe we could use this guy, groom this guy, and he could overthrow Rome for us. That's what the Jewish people wanted. They're saying, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're laying down palm trees and other gospel accounts say that they're taking clothes and they're throwing it out um, as on the ground as he's walking through. It would be something that you do for um, a, a, a military leader um, who's gained a victory, or it'd be somebody for somebody that's very, very important. It was a tradition that was uh, utilized in, in without, within that uh, time frame in Jewish history. But then we see the confirmation of prophecy that occurs. God's been working ahead of time. And in verses 14 through 15, it says this, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, uh, just as it is written. Help me finish this. Just as it is what? Written. What was written? Well, according to Zechariah 9.9, 9, it was a prophecy that the Messiah would come in riding a donkey. Um, a donkey would be a, a symbol of um, a peace in many ways uh, that a king has established after a wartime, and Jesus comes in riding on this young donkey. Other gospel accounts say that they took two. Uh, probably they took an older uh, donkey, and then they took a younger one. And if you've ever handled horses or donkeys before, um, sometimes you take the veteran, the older one, to help the younger one figure out where to follow. And Jesus doesn't ride on the mature one. He rides on the young one, uh, symbolizing even more, I think, humility. Zechariah 9.9, 9, this is a prophetic uh, text here um, that's being fulfilled. Um, Zechariah 9.9 9 is another, it's a prophecy, a messianic prophecy. Did you know that there's over 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that have actually been fulfilled? Um, What's amazing to me is I'll just list off a number of prophecies, eight different ones, and give you the mathematical probability of it uh, coming to pass. Uh, the time of Jesus' birth was prophesied out of Daniel 8 and 9. The prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem came out of Micah. The prophecy that Jesus would be born of a virgin came out of Isaiah the prophecy that he would be betrayed by 30, for 30 pieces of silver came out of Zechariah. The prophecy that he would be mocked out of Psalms. The prophecy that he would be crucified. All throughout the scripture, he was pierced. He would die with the wicked, that he would be buried, and he would, uh, be, he would die poor, and he would be buried uh, with the rich. Isaiah 53, 9. Uh, mathematics and astronomer... Um, Professor Peter W. Stoner has made this statement. He said that the chances of just eight of these prophecies coming true in the life of one individual is the probability of, I've got my notes here, one in 10 to the 17th power. How many of you are, are uh, decent at math? Raise your hand. 
Okay, we need more mathematicians. Um, let me help you understand what 1 in the 10 or 10 to the 17th power is. If you have one zero on a number, that means it's a 10, or uh, if you have, or it's in the 10, or if there's two, it's in the hundreds, or three zeros would be thousands, four zeros would be 10,000, uh, five would be 100,000, six, a million, nine, a billion, 12 would be a trillion. If you have 15 zeros on the end of a number, it means quadrillion. So the probability of one person fulfilling eight prophecies um, is one in 10 to the 17th power. That's more than one in a quadrillion probability. It means it's just not going to happen. Um, here's what happens with, you could, let me illustrate it like this. Imagine if somebody got in a helicopter, took a silver dollar bill, put an X on it, and somebody else came into Texas and filled up the entire state with silver dollars two feet high. The guy in the helicopter flies over Texas, throws the silver dollar with a little X on it, marked on it, finds a blind man and says, hey, I want you to march out through Texas, start at the north, the east, the south, the west, wherever you want. I want you to march into Texas and find that silver dollar with that mark. That would be about a 1 in 10 to the 17th power chance that he's going to find that. And so the guy walks into the state of Texas, and what are the chances that he's going to walk in, pull out the silver dollar, and say, is this it? And everybody say, oh my goodness, you found it. That is the probability of Jesus fulfilling all this and what's amazing about that, that's, one in, that's eight different prophecies that I just mentioned. That's one in 10 to the 17th uh, probability that that could happen. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. That is incredible. Um, there's a confirmation of prophecy that is occurring. Jesus shows up. Uh, he's fulfilling prophecy it's also out of Genesis 49, Isaiah 40 as well. He's fulfilling prophecy. And the disciples are confused about it. They don't understand the magnitude of what is happening. Uh, perhaps some of the people in the crowd are aware that there was a prophecy that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding a donkey. And so perhaps this escalated the crowds. And so it just has a ripple effect and more and more people are gathering because they've heard of this idea that maybe the king would come in like this. But notice what it says. It says, verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. I love the idea that God uses the language daughter. Um, the Jerusalem was personified as the daughters of Zion. It was a very personal, endearing term. Um, I, I think about this for, for our men. Um, how many of you have daughters? Raise your hand. Yeah. You have a sacred privilege and a sacred role in today's time. You, there's always a very powerful role and responsibility in raising daughters and and God uses this language, a very familial language that we're daughters and sons of God, um, that we're a family, that God is our father. And the, the word here is, fear not, daughter of Zion. Zechariah wrote this, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Is Jesus a king? Yes, he is a king. Well, what's he doing? What's his role? This is his first coming. Will he come back? Yes, he will come back. They're confused about his kingship. Um, God's word says, fear not. They don't have to be afraid. Many of the disciples are afraid, and they're definitely confused. What are they confused about? They're confused about Jesus' role as a king. What's he going to accomplish in his first coming? Three different things that you need to know about King Jesus. Number one, when Jesus came in his first coming, Jesus is coming to conquer sin and Satan. He's not coming to conquer Rome. And that's exactly what they thought he was going to do. Uh, Jesus is, comes to conquer sin and Satan, and, he, and he's coming to conquer it at the what? At the cross. 
This is where it would happen. King Jesus is riding into town, willfully acknowledging, fulfilling prophetic scriptures, and he's, he is destined to die for the sins of the world. That all who would turn to him could find salvation, hope, and healing. Jesus is coming to reverse the curse, to begin to fix the problem and be uh, the salvation. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossians about this act of conquering sin and Satan. He says, uh, Colossians 2, 14 and 15, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. He canceled our debt, our sin. Verse 15, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and the authorities. He shamed them publicly uh, by his victory over them on the cross. What you need to know as a Christian you have power over sin because of Jesus Christ. You can overcome your addiction. You can overcome these uh, uh, overwhelming sinful habits and struggles in your life. Because of Jesus Christ, there's not a power over you other than that power of Jesus Christ. You have a supernatural power because of Jesus Christ. Um, and you are saved from the penalty of sin. He has shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus has victory over your life. As a Christian, you live forever. Uh, Christians will continue forever. Uh, you have victory over sin. You have victory over uh, Satan's work and attacks. It doesn't mean you won't struggle. But Jesus came, make no doubt about it, willfully to Jerusalem to conquer but he wasn't coming to conquer an evil Roman empire. He was coming to conquer sin and Satan. Amen? You have to understand that because that's what the disciples did not understand. The people in Jerusalem, uh, the, the fringe believers, the crowds, they didn't want him to come conquer sin and Satan. They wanted him to come conquer Caesar. That's what they wanted. Number two, you need to know that Jesus came to offer peace. They were a little confused about this. They thought, oh, well, he's going to make peace, uh, the peace of Rome, Pax Romana, Pax Roma. They were going to create this peace, perhaps, and it would all go all throughout the, uh, the world, overcome that peace, and be God's peace. They were thinking there would be a, a brand new theocracy, if you will. Like maybe, maybe Jesus would establish a kingdom, and maybe they thought, well, he's going to come and create a new peace create war with Caesar, Augustus, and the Roman Empire. But it is true, Jesus did come to offer peace. So what kind of peace is that? It's a peace that connects us to the cross. Look what Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, we, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through, help me out, our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that Jesus was bringing came through the cross. It didn't come through evolution of an earthly kingdom. The peace that Jesus was creating was so that you could have a relationship with God the Father. The peace that, and this is why it's too, Zechariah says, Fear not, O daughter of, Jeru of Zion. You don't have to be afraid. You can find peace. Today's time, we're afraid, we're anxious, we're stressed. So much of that. And a relationship with God through the person and the work of Jesus Christ means that you and I can find peace. We can find peace today. We can find peace tomorrow. That you and I can be settled in our souls and find a peace. And it comes through the cross. Number three, you need to understand that Jesus will come back and he will come back to make war. Some of you guys are like, oh yeah, that's good. You see evil on the TV or hear it on the radio. The other day, my daughter and I are driving around and news media outlets were just sifting through the XM radio, listening to different news headlines. And literally, I kid you not, it was so weird. It's like it was like it was all, it felt like entertainment. Don't miss what's next. We got shootings and suicides and more to come with riots. Be back in a minute. I turn off the radio and I said, hey, sweetie, how about we hear more good news before we listen to this bad news? 
Let, let me, let's turn on a Christian radio station for a minute and worship. And let me remind you of all the good things that we have as uh, believers. Well, because there's so much bad news and there's so much evil in the world, the Bible does tell us that Jesus will come back to make war. He will. When Jesus said, the Lord's Prayer, help me out, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, thy will be on earth as it is in and that's not here and now. It's not heaven on earth. His kingdom has not come, but it will come. It really will come. Revelation 19, 11 says this. The apostle John writes about this future day when he's coming back, and he's not riding on a donkey. He's riding on a war horse. The apostle John says, Then I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and and in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. Jesus is coming back and he will wage war on all evil. He will overthrow all of uh, Satan and, and the uh, evil workers. Verse 12, look what it says. His eyes are like a flame of fire. In his first coming, his eyes are said to be filled with tears over Jerusalem. In his second coming, his eyes are filled with fire. He says, and on his head are many diadems. Uh, this is a king's crown of victory. In his first coming, Jesus doesn't wear a crown of victory. He wears a crown of thorns. He says, continued on it, he says, and he has a, a name written that no one knows but himself. In verse 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And that's battle blood. In his first coming, he wears a borrowed robe, um, but it's spattered with his own blood. And it says, and the name by which he is called is the word of God and the armies of heaven, uh, arrayed in fine linen, uh, white and pure, were following him on the white horses. I, I read this for the first time and was struck again with the idea of like, man, this is kind of cool. Like the armies of heaven are coming with King Jesus one day. That's where we get that song. Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in. Help me out. I want to be a part. There you go. Come on. There you go. The jazz band, uh, New Orleans style. There's going to be a day when there will be armies from heaven following King Jesus, and it will overthrow all evil in our world. It will be a new heaven, a new earth. Every time I visit a very remote area in this state or around the country or around the world, and I see how beautiful it is, and I think, man, I hate to go. I love it. I miss Maui already, but I'm reminded of the promise that God says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, which no eye has seen, no eye ear has heard about all the beauty and the majesty that will come. Uh, we'll get to experience so much of this. Um, but there is King Jesus. He is coming back, and the saints and the armies of heaven are coming with him on their own white horses. So if you don't like to ride a horse, you're going to have to talk to Jesus because there's a bunch of people coming on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, and which will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty, and on his robe, his thigh, he has a name written, and help me out, King of, let's try that again, King of, and Lord of, that's our King Jesus. So he is coming to make war one day. That was the confusion. They thought he was going to do it in the first coming. His first coming? No, he came to make peace. He came to make peace, and he did it through himself as a sacrifice on the cross. On Good Friday, at the culmination of the Passover, when everybody's slaughtering lambs, the Lamb of God would be slain on the cross. There is confusion. Verse 16, look what happens. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when 
Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. They didn't understand at first. How many of you are a little slow at learning? Raise your hand. Look at the humble humility of our friends here. Yeah, I'm a little slow at learning too. You know, um, in high school, I was just a little slower, you know, um, but once I got it, I, I, I got it. Um, in college, I made the dean's list. I had to sit on the front row to eliminate distractions. In seminary, um, I had sat on the front row. I took notes. I recorded the professor's uh, talks. I always tell my son and my kids, I'm like, they're struggling in school from time to time. And I tell them, well, do you take notes? Do you sit up front? Do you record the lectures? <laughs> like, all of these matter. Um, the disciples, can you... Can you imagine? You'd think that they would get it. They got hands-on training with Jesus. I mean, just remember Peter in Matthew 16, 22. 22 Jesus tells them, like, Peter, I'm going to the cross. I'm, I'm going to die. And it says Peter takes Jesus aside, Matthew 16, 22. He takes Jesus aside, and the Bible says he began to rebuke Jesus. How dare you talk like that? And then Jesus says those famous words, hey, Peter, get behind me. Don't ever try that on your wife. <laughs> Don't ever try that on your husband. Uh, Peter says, uh, Jesus, how dare you talk about your crucifixion? How dare you talk? He's rebuking Jesus, Matthew 16, 22. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus had a destiny to die, to serve as a sacrificial uh, lamb that would be slain for the sins of the world. Uh, but the disciples were confused. Uh, Luke 18, 34, Jesus foretold his death a third time, and it says they understood none of these things. The disciples didn't get it. It's okay to be a slow learner. If the disciples couldn't get it very quick, you're in good company. There's confusion, but there's also curiosity. Let's look at the crowds. Verse 17 through 18, the crowd that had been with them when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. There's always curiosity about uh, miracles that take place. So the spectacular event of Jesus Christ in his ministry, he's constantly uh, impressing people because he does things that nobody else can do. He takes a, a leopard man who's got a, a very uh, contagious disease, a very horrendous disease. There's no cure. He heals the guy. That is Simon the leper. Then he takes Lazarus, who's dead, and then he resurrects him. He was dead. And the Bible said he stinketh. He'd been dead a very long time. And Jesus comes out and raises him from the dead with a command, one word. That's Lazarus, come out. More than one word. See, I need help with math. Um, and so you, there's this curiosity about Jesus. Uh, John 6, 2 tells us that a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing. And in John 12, 9 through 12, earlier, when the large crowd of the Jews had learned that Jesus was there, with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, we learned last week, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Uh, there's curiosity in the crowds. The crowds are coming into Jerusalem to see Jesus. And then we're going to see the coveting of the Pharisees in verse 19. What are they coveting? I think they're coveting power. They want power and control. Anybody struggle with control here? Just kind of control freaks? Okay. Yeah, there can be a very strong desire to have control. I think the Pharisees wanted control. Um, the Pharisees, not all of them are bad. Most of them are. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He loved the Scriptures, but guess what? He loved more than the Scriptures. He loved the Savior. My concern is in churches today is that if you love the Bible, but you don't love Jesus or people, you're just going to be a Pharisee. The Pharisees wanted and followed rules far more than they wanted the Redeemer. They missed it. They're coveting. 
They're coveting Jesus' popularity. They're coveting Jesus' power, his influence. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you're gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. That's hyperbole. That's an exaggeration. We know the whole world isn't following Jesus, and they weren't back then, and they're not today. But this is fear talking. This is lack of control. In John 4, 1, uh, when Jesus started his ministries, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and and baptizing more disciples than John was, and they're very concerned about it. They coveted power. They coveted influence. They always have, and they always did. In John 11, 46 through 48, it tells us that the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, "What what are we to do with this man? He performs so many signs. If we let him go, and then everyone's gonna believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What was the problem? Uh, The problem was is that they coveted power. They idolized it. Coveting is what you is wanting something that is not yours. What did Jesus have? He had power, incredible power. He had power over creation. He had power uh, to speak, and a storm would be stilled with just one word. Uh, he would raise the dead. He had power over people. He had power over the demonic. He demonstrated this. He declared this. Uh, they saw him as the coming king, and he was an incredible threat. They coveted his power, and they were re- wanted to control him, and they would be even willing to kill for it. There's a real evil that takes place in all of this activity, and there's a real evil um, that's happening in our world right now. And I want to pause for a moment and speak to you as a pastor um, who's concerned with some of the evil that we see in our world. I'm sure that Many of you have heard the story of the Covenant School shooting. Would you raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 99% of you for sure. Um, the other day, I was taking my daughter to a private Christian school. We pulled her out of the, a public school system. And just by the way, I'm not anti-public school, but I'm very concerned about a lot of the public schools. Um, my kids have been in public school from kindergarten up to 12th grade. I have two kids that will be graduating from the public school system. And my kids are strong and walking with Jesus and standing up for their faith, just FYI. However, my younger child, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let believe that we have the same system and the same education system we had five years ago. Five years ago, th- I'm, saying, I'm telling you, things have changed radically. If you're a new mom, new dad, you better wake up because there is an educational indoctrination that is going on. And so um, I got my kid in a private school, my little one, and it's a great little um, private Christian school. Um, I'm dropping her off, and I'm thinking after I heard this news, that could be my kid. That could be any school. March 27th, a mass shooting occurred at Covenant School in Nashville. Um, A former student uh, walked in. Audrey is her name. Audrey Elizabeth Hale, she was 28 years old, former student at a Christian school, kills three children, three adults. Um, Tragic. Little kids, they're like nine years old. Um, I think a, a, a custodian, a substitute teacher, and somebody in administration. Um, I don't say this as any kind of fear tactic, but I, I want to talk to you about evil for a moment. So all of that, that's the label called evil. Amen? The Bible says that Satan came to kill, to steal, and what? Destroy. Destroy. Um, What's being right now, what's stolen from us in so many ways is our youth and our children. Parents, uh, it's your job. Don't let anybody steal your kids. Don't let culture steal your kids. Don't let schools steal your kids. Don't let the government steal your kids. They're your kids. You raise them to love, to know, as for me and my household, we shall. That's what you should do. Dad, you have a responsibility for your daughter. I don't know the backstory with this, uh, this girl who changed her name. She's, uh, ch- uh, she's changed her name. I think it is Aiden. Um, transgender, which the media didn't report that a whole lot. 
They called, they changed, we're all big on pronouns in culture, but no pronouns were used for the shooter. I think not to negatively associate the idea of a transgender terrorist, because that's what it was. It was absolutely terrorism. Um, I think what is impressive is the first responders. I think they got a call, and within 14 minutes, the first responders show up. Two minutes on the scene, the threat is eliminated. My point in sharing this to you is that that's really evil, and evil happens in our world. And what is the problem? And many people would say, uh, more gun laws, stricter gun laws. Let me tell you the real problem, okay? The real problem is a three-letter word, S-I, help me out, okay? And then my question would be is, where is the dad affirming the little girl I love you. I'm here for you. You're a beautiful little girl. You're made in God's image. I'll be your daddy. I'll take care of you. I will protect you. If you're hurt, you can come to me. You do not have to be afraid. I don't know what was going on with the dad, but I do know any kid that moves from wanting to change their identity to something that is not natural and not normal will only face more stress, anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Amen? It is not normal. Let's not call it normal. Could it be a mental disease for the little girl wanting to change to a, uh, a, a, a man, a male? It could be. It very well could be. That at the end of the day, this is the result of sin. And when you give in to sin, guess what happens? You're opening the floodgates for evil to come in. And so what does she do? She, which is not normal, a female would be so aggressive, goes into a school and eliminates anybody that perhaps in her mind represented the anti-messaging towards perhaps transgender ideology and last week, I told you we were here together, and I said, as a Christian, you should expect an increased level of persecution. Do you remember that? And 24 hours later, there is a, a mass shooting targeting Christians. I re referenced last week with Arizona Christian University being uh, blacklisted, uh, another form of persecution. They canceled contracts because the school district said, guess what? All of those teachers over there, all of those student teachers, they're too biblically minded. That's persecution. Why am I saying this? Because I want to tell you that as a believer, you need to be stronger. You need to be strong. You need to invest into your little kids' lives so that they don't grow up confused, not knowing what to do, becoming overwhelmed with the power and the temptation of sin, confused. There's an absolute... Uh, dismantling of the regular family, husband, wife. So you, here's what you need to do. What do you need to know about God, yourself, and others? Out of the text, number one is when, when God does a good work in your life, you ought to be a good witness. Mom, dad, church member, you be a good witness for Jesus Christ. You show people what to love. You show people what it looks to lead. You show people what it looks like to forgive. Whatever good work has happened in your life, you be a good witness. Lazarus is a great example of that. The crowd that had been with him when he, uh, he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Lazarus was telling people about Jesus. We don't know a lot of what he was saying. He wasn't saying a lot uh, but John the Apostle, not a word is mentioned about him, but at least he's there. Dads, just be there for your kids. Um, Sunday school teacher, be here with the kids. Uh, moms, be present. Just bear witness, and your very presence is showing up in people's lives. When God does a good work in your life, when God does a good work in anybody's life, the responsibility is to be a good witness. Second point, most people want a sign and some want the Savior. Um, this happened throughout the scripture. We see the reason why the crowd went to meet him uh, was that they learned that he had done this sign. 
People just kind of flocked to Jesus and they wanted signs. But more than anything, what people need is Jesus. That's what people need. Um, we don't need more rules and regulations. We need a redeemer more than anything. Um, you can put everything into place, but uh, people were wanting more signs. What they were missing out on was the Savior, Jesus Christ himself. As a believer, you have a responsibility not to seek signs and miracles and all these miraculous answers to prayer, but to faithfully uh, meet with Jesus, know Jesus, and follow Jesus all the days of your life. And your Christian life, maybe there'll be some signs and wonders from time to time. But just be faithful to follow Jesus all the time. Amen? Uh, number three, some people are motivated by fear. Or most are motivated by love. Sometimes we think the opposite, that most people are motivated by fear. I don't think that's true in the grand scale of things. How many of you would acknowledge that maybe you're, you, you uh, motivate people out of fear sometimes, like parenting? If you don't do this, this is going to happen. I've been guilty of that before with my kids. I'm like, if you don't do this, you don't do that, this is going to happen. Um, look what they say, the Pharisees. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. They're afraid. And what they have been doing is enslaving people into legalism, uh, making them fearful whether they will achieve or earn their salvation. They had to keep all the law and everything that was written in it. And you see this in a lot in cultish movements, um, things that are, uh, they, they put all these laws and plans in place. It's very fear-based religion, a lot of fear-based religion. Christian, the true Christian faith is faith-based you just believe in Jesus. You believe that you're loved. Believe that you're accepted. Believe that you're secure. Believe that it's all by God's grace, that you don't do it yourself. Believe. The Bible over and over says, fear not, fear not, fear not. Some people are motivated by fear. Some are motivated by love. This is what Jesus said. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another by this all people. Um, that word is the ethnos. It is the all ethnic groups all around the world. All people will know that you are my disciples if you love, help me out, one another. Love is a powerful thing. I remember years ago when we first adopted my child and she came in um, maybe 12, 14 months old and um, you could physically see a change in her countenance and her appearance after about six to nine months. And one of my neighbor came up to me and they said, um, hey, Pastor Ryan, what did you do to change your child? And this quick, I said, we loved her. That was it. That's all we did. We just loved her. Um, love changes things. It is the most powerful influence. It's a leadership lesson too, by the way you love people. If you're uh, an employer or a boss, if all you do is try to motivate your people by fear, they'll end up leaving. They won't stick around. If you're being motivated out of fear, you'll stick around for a little bit, but you'll want to leave. You won't stick around. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte, he says it, from 1769 to 1821, is considered one of the world's greatest military commanders in history. Um, he says this. He says, Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. In other words, fear. But then he says this about Jesus. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Love changes everything. I want to challenge you to make a difference in the world around you. And you lead not out of hate, you lead out of love. We have a king that we worship and we follow and we live for. His name is Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can see in the scriptures in your first coming and understand in your second coming. Lord, as we see the bad news of, in the world around us, we should be reminded of the good news that we have with you and through you. Lord, I pray for any and all that, Lord, are afraid 
I pray that they would place their faith in you, trust in you, Lord, and know that they can have a peace which surpasses all understanding as they walk with you and trust in you. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, in just a moment, I want to invite you up to receive communion. Communion is an opportunity to remember God's great love for you. Um, that on good, that Good Friday, Jesus would make a sacrifice that would have eternal uh, impact. And that you as an individual, whatever stress or whatever sin or sorrow that you hold on to, you need to be reminded of God's great love for you at the cross. You need to be reminded of what the Apostle Paul told the church and the Christians in Rome. He says, it's through the Lord Jesus Christ that you have peace with God. At the end of your day, you need to know that you can find peace with God, and it happens through Jesus. It was the cross. His body was broken for your sake so that you can be healed and whole. Um, he died the death we deserve. The problem in our world is sin. The, the answer to that problem is Jesus. Amen? So come forward this morning and receive communion. Be refreshed. Be renewed. Um, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as you're ready and take it as you're ready.